if all we did today was worship the Lord in song and prayer, and pray for people in their time of need, do you think that would be, and would you be content to just do that and feel like you've been in church, you know? Uh, because sometimes we make it about the message, get through the program, and then we go home. we got this whole program. But I want to remind us that we're here, and we're at his disposal. He's not just at our disposal. We're here for him. So whatever needs to be done, we want him to lead us in what's the most important thing to do. And God cares about how we care for one another. Can I get an amen? God, God cares about how we treat one another. Amen. In the body of Christ. Just like he cares for the way we treat people in our home. Just like he cares for the way we treat people on the job. Amen. In society, in culture. God cares about that. So the word is good. We need the word. We need the word all the time. And you're not going to get out of the message, by the way, when we're saying this. So just, just so you know. I feel like I have a word that I have to share with you today. It's a very difficult word for me. Like I said, when you preach through a book, you can't ignore the difficult passages. And this is the first time I've ever attempted to preach on something like this. But I do believe God has a word for us. I want to tell you, in my heart, I feel like God has a word for us in his word. But I want you to know that that's important, but also what's important is that we take time to pray for people. We take time to respond to one another and seek the Lord and uh, love one another corporately and individually. If that's okay with you, right? Good, because you are the body of Christ, right? We are members of the body, this glorious kingdom, this glorious church, and uh, he cares about the way we care about one another. So, today I'm going to ask you to, uh, uh, if you look at your Bible quickly, at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 14 and 15, I just want to refer to this, then we're going to go all the way back up to chapter 6, because I'm going to need some spiritual maturity today, <laughs> from you and from me, I'm going to need some real spiritual maturity, the kind that says, like Paul talked about in Ephesians 4, 14 and 15, it's not on the screen, I'm just referring to it. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness by people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. So I'm asking you today to hear with your spirit, hear what the word is saying, and process that through the eyes, the attitude, the mind of Christ, which we can have through the Spirit. And I want us to pray this prayer of enlightenment together, again, because we need the Holy Spirit to help us. It's Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 17 through 19. Would you pray that with me with all your heart? We keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. We pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Can you say amen? And Lord, our words on earth, may they become true in heaven. That's what we certainly need. So, so far, it mentions the whole idea, the main needs of this book is who we are in Christ. When we come to Christ, we're forgiven, we're chosen, we're redeemed, we're adopted into the family of God, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, we're united in one Body with every other blood-bought believer across the world and across the ages, right? Uh, and then it talks about how who we are affects the way we behave. Because you say you believe something so true, but if you don't act it out, if you don't act on it, do you really believe it, right? So if we say we know who we are in Christ, then we also have to obey. We, we know that it will transform the way we live, right? As Christians, we're supposed in the body of Christ, we're supposed to keep the unity of the faith. Remember that passage? We're supposed to build one another up with our words and with our actions. We're supposed to speak the truth, but do it in love. We're supposed to care one for another and not just take care of ourselves. 
As Christian husbands and wives, we are supposed to practice mutual submission, love, and respect all the way around. As Christian parents and children, we are to obey, to respect, to nurture, and to train. Why? Because that's who we are in Christ. It's different from the way we used to be. It's different from the patterns of this world. This is who we are, and if we are who we say we are, we will do what that comes with our identity. Amen. And now today, we're going to talk about that, 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 that how our Christianity transforms us so completely that it would even affect the relationship between masters and slaves. Yep. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses five through nine. Let's read it together. We just finished about parents and children and husbands and wives. Now we're going to talk about another component of the Greco-Roman household of that day. It says, verse 5, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ. Doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Even though that may be a challenging passage, can you say amen to God's words? Amen. So, we're talking about, uh, in those passages 5 and 6, what many have called the house commands, or the way a Christian household should be ordered. Right? Talk about husbands and wives, parents and children, masters, slaves, bond servants. These are all house commands. And, I, we, and if you do a little bit of looking into it, Paul did this also in the book of Colossians. He did this when he wrote Timothy. He, he did it in several places, talked about the relationships in the home and how they reflected the nature of Christ in the godless, Christless culture of their day. You, why did Paul feel the need to address these household relationships as a part of his teaching about our identity in Christ and our unity in the Spirit? Believe it or not, Christianity was accused in Roman society, the Greco-Roman culture of the world, of being, first of all, atheistic. They said, these Christians, they're atheists because they only believe in one God and they don't have any idols. They said there's only one God and we can't make an idol to him. We're supposed to serve him. That's it. And so they reject all the pantheons of the gods in the world. And so they were actually accused of being atheists, which to the Greco Roman mind was just, well, it's just immoral. If you don't believe in any God, if you don't believe in, any, in the gods that we believe in, it's unreasonable because it's just the way things are. Can you imagine Christianity being confused of being atheist? But it was. It was also accused of being anarchistic. They talked about Christ above Caesar. They said Jesus is more important than Caesar. Jesus is more important than governors and sheriffs and whoever else. And they thought that meant they wanted to bring down the government. Which is not true at all, but that's the accusation that was made. Their rabid devotion to Christ above the state made them think that they were trying to tear down the state Christianity was not trying to tear down the state. It was trying to show the state a better way to live. A better kingdom, a kingdom that exists above all other governments. But they were accused of being anarchistic. Another one is uh, the, the Roman culture uh, accused Christians of being immoral. <laughs> you know why? Because they talk so much about love. Love God, love God, love one another, love, love, love. They talk about these crazy things they call love feasts. In the New Testament day, and as they come together on a Sunday, they'd all bring food, they'd all fellowship, they'd all do this crazy uh, share the cup and the bread thing. And we just think what they do is they get together and have big orgies. That's what they do. That's kind of these Christians are immoral. They will tear down society because of all this talk about love, love, love. No responsibility, no duty, just love. They also thought that they were anti-family, believed that they would bring their family structure 
uh, down. Christians talk about their wives being dedicated to Christ above their husbands, giving honor to God. Because in that religion, in that part of the world, that if you were part of the family, you took the religion of your father, or sir, or your husband. It's just what happened. If he was Muslim, you'd be Muslim. Your kids would be Muslim, and they were this, and they would be. So they were saying to Christian women, "There's a higher." Authority of religion, even than the religion of your husband. Paul had to give special instructions about that. In in First Corinthians, he talked about if a if a woman is a believer and she has an unbelieving husband, then the best way for it to go is that if her husband will keep her around, because a lot of times if they wouldn't follow the religion of the husband, they would kick them out, they would divorce them and be done with them. But if she has a husband who's pleased to let her dwell with him then she should. You don't know but what her conduct might win the unbelieving husband to the Lord. Right? But if that husband departs, then let it depart. The brother or sister's not under bondage in that case. Why? Because we have a higher authority, a higher call in our, 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 our the way we live. They also believe that, and then all this talk about mutual submission, what are you talking about? Husband love your wives, and Christ love the church. Submit to them, to their needs, do what they need above your own. Come on, man, this is, you're going to tear apart our families if this structure is changed, and we don't know what's going to happen. They thought they were antisocial. Paul's teaching that he's given here today about slaves and, and, and masters and bond servants is amazing because if you read it, understanding what's going on, he's raising slaves in, to equal dignity, and value of their masters. In Christ, Galatians, there is no male and female. There is no uh, bond or free. There, there is no Jew or Gentile, but where there's only Christ. And so they thought, hey, these slaves are going to get the big head and start rebelling and things like that. And that's a difficult thing for us to handle. We're going to handle that. But, but the, the important thing you need to understand is that in Paul's teaching, he would be gave everyone equal dignity in the church. Get this picture in your mind because it's a beautiful picture. And I believe this picture will change the way you look at other people. Okay? You have to picture this in the New Testament church. When they get together on the, on the first day of the week, on Sunday, and they bring their meal together, right? Everybody brings what they can. And they fellowship, and then they have a service, and then they do communion. When, you, when they come up to take communion or they pass the cup and they pass the bread, however they did it, right there in that same congregation, I mean in one place, in one place, every societal boundary was busted wide open. Because right there taking the same cup and the same bread were, were slaves and free people. Sometimes slaves and their masters were doing communion together. Uh, you had you had uh, masters and servants. You had men and women together partaking of the Lord's Supper. You had children with adults. Come on now, children are much, not not much more than cattle in that in that, under, in that society. But here they're sharing the common meal together. You have rich and poor that are all participating. In the same service. They're partaking of the same bread and wine of Christ. And all of this was seen as a threat to Greco Roman society. Why? Because anytime there's a change in the status quo, it's undesirable to the people who have all the power and who like the way things are. Can I get an amen? It's the powerful people uh, who want to keep things the way they are because they're the ones who are being benefited by it. But in the church, it's come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Rich, poor, slave, free, doesn't matter. When you come into this house, you are with Christ. You are my brother. You are my sister. You have equal dignity. You have equal value. You have equal worth and purpose in God's kingdom. Amen. Paul's focus was the impact of the gospel on every relationship in life. And he was bridging the gap between refuting these false accusations and bringing the life-changing gospel. This radical gospel that Jesus died for everyone's sins. And they, when, when they would hear that message, they would sort of apply that to their particular social class. If you're a wealthy person, you'd say, okay, great, Jesus Christ died for wealthy people. And then the message is, no, no, he didn't just die for the wealthy people, he died for the poor people too. And they say, wait a minute, I don't know if I can be part of it. 
right? Because the distance was maintained in order to control people. The power, the powerful exercise their power for their power, their own, their own glory and good, not for the needs of the people. At the same time, they needed the people, by the way, because if they if, if, if things change, they wouldn't have the workers, and they'd have me. Oh, God forbid, if I have to pay them more, right? <laughs> so it could make a real difference in their standing. So many people didn't feel like they could be a part because uh, it would change the common way things were done. And that's why Jesus said when John was looking for Jesus, saying uh, Jesus, asked Jesus the question through his disciples, are you the one, or should we be looking for another? Jesus told his disciples, go back and tell John, he says, the poor are hearing the gospel. That was an important thing. They were running to the gospel because they realized what a great uh, opportunity it was for them, not to raise their level in society, but to become a child of God. That's really important. So while while he his teaching didn't directly address the evils of slavery, it's true there was slavery. Slavery is evil. Can we say amen to that? There's no doubt about that. But there are many kinds of slavery too, and they were practiced during that day, that day. There was marital slavery. You treat your wife just about the way you wanted to. There was parental slavery. You could, you could kill your children. You could sell your children. You could do terrible things to your children, and you had the right to do that. That's slavery. There was governmental slavery. They could come and take everything you had and say, you're going to do this from now on, and you get what we give you. There was also forced slavery, like the victims of wars. When the Romans won wars, they took prisoner, brought, brought them back, and they... They, they sold them as slaves. So he didn't come out right out and say about the evils of slavery, but his teaching was so subversive because it raised people to equal dignity in the eyes of God. He began to transform the culture from the inside out. When Paul started teaching this stuff, it did start a revolution. It took too long to come about, and took, especially when you get to the 19th century in America and England and other places. That's what we think about when we think about slavery. It took too long for this thing to get resolved, but this teaching is what started it all, that all people are created in the eyes of God equally. Amen. They have equal dignity, value, purpose, despite their situation despite their social calling. I, I, I want to be very precise with this. Do you mind if I read a little bit from the commentary? Is that okay? I, I think Kyle Snodgrass in the New International Version uh, application test, test uh, commentary, he says some things, and I, I think he says it well, probably better than I can. And you know, I, I like to be able to blame somebody else if someone gets mad. No, I hear you. Yeah, I know you're not going to get mad. I have prayed about this, by the way, because this is a delicate subject. Can I get any of I mean, if you, you read that passage, you might have thought, what's he going to say about that? Slaves and masters. And the safety team has already told me, he said, we got your back until you get cornered in the, in the, in the lobby, then you're on your own. <laughs> Thanks, guys, I appreciate it. <laughs> but I'm not worried because we're going to talk about the Word of God. And it, I tell you, if you understand where it's coming from, it's a beautiful passage. and has direct application to where you are right now today. Your life. Okay, here's what he says. He says, slaves and masters, not only is slavery foreign to us, but our understanding of it has been determined by 19th century slavery in the, in the United States, right? In the 18th century, we started bringing slaves in the 1700s, 1800s, 90, and, and up through uh, even well through the 1800s, which would be the 19th century. The, in, this increases our difficulty in understanding why the early church didn't call for a wholesale rejection of slavery. Isn't that the question you have? Why did Paul stand up and say slavery is a sin. Set your slaves free. That's kind of what we want. But when I look back into our own history, I think that even after the civil rights movement, our churches were kind of slow to adopt that. There was still a lot of segregation. There's still a lot of prejudice going on much too long. And I asked somebody, he said, how could you do that? And he said, well, it was the time in which we lived. Yes, it was wrong. It took too much time. And, but, but, and so Paul was saying, yes, I'm going to handle this, but we're going to start from the inside out. So it's a real and enduring change. But again, his object was not to defeat slavery. It was to get people to know Jesus. Because when people know Jesus, he transforms their lives.
Okay? So in, in the Greco Roman world, slavery was so, was so much a part of life that hardly anyone thought about whether it might be illegitimate. It was considered an economic and practical necessity and assumed part of life as much as the birds and the trees. The scholars are reluctant to hazard estimates about the numbers of slaves, but as many as one third of the people in Greece and Rome were slaves. Now get that in your mind. As many as one third of the entire population of Greece and Rome were living in some form of slavery. All right? In addressing them, Paul was addressing an enormous number of people. Think about that, one third of the population. People became slaves through various avenues. Here's how they became slaves. Birth, if you were born to slave parents, you were a slave, you belonged to their owner. Parental selling. Parents who couldn't pay their debts or didn't want the child could sell them into slavery to another person and get money for them. Or abandonment. A lot of times girls were not valued. They wanted sons. Girls were just a hindrance. So they would abandon children. And sometimes the abandoned children would be taken into a home and they would have the status of a slave. So they start out their life at least alive, but as a slave. Captivity and war. People, like I said, the Romans made war all the time and they brought back slaves of every nation that they conquered. The inability to pay debts. You can put yourself into slavery because you can't pay your debts. You can say, well, at least I'll have something to eat. At least I'll have food to, or clothes. At least I'll have a place to live. So I'm going to sell myself into slavery, which means you become the property of someone else. Sometimes they're bought servant arrangements that you'll work for me uh, for this amount of time and I will pay you this much, but there was there were both kinds. And sometimes, if you believe this, people became slaves to better their own condition. Uh, it's a person of a low, low class who can't provide for themselves, sometimes if they can get a job, become a slave of a wealthy family, they were well cared for if the master was a good master. And so many times to improve their own situation in, in society, they would try to move up the ladder through being a servant or a slave of someone from the higher classes. Isn't that just boring for us? Because we value our freedom so very much, right? We'd rather die free, right? That's right. Than, than be, um, owe, uh, owe anybody anything for, for what we have. But here's one thing. Race was not a factor. In New Testament slavery. It was no factor. There were people from every nation and every ethnicity. It, was, it wasn't about one particular nation of, of people or one particular ethnicity. They had people of every ethnicity who were slaves in the Roman and, and the Greek cultures. Isn't that amazing? So it wasn't about color or ethnicity. It was about power. That's what it was about. And it affected people of every conquered nation and every social strata except for the highest. No doubt many slaves, the life of many slaves' life was harsh and cruel, but their circumstances depended on their owners. They didn't do merely menial work. They did nearly all the work, including oversight and management in most professions. Many were educated better than their owners. They could own property. Some slaves could even own other slaves and were allowed to save money to buy their freedom. No slave class existed where slaves were present in all but the highest economic and social strata. Many gained freedom by the age 30, especially in urban areas, but even after gaining freedom, they were still under obligation to their former owners in times of need. So you always had that connection. Remember, these are house commands. It was just a part of the Greco-Roman household. I'm not saying it's right. It's the way it was. And Paul was preaching the gospel into that environment and brought about some astounding changes. There were slaves that there were laws that tried to protect slaves, but essentially a slave owner could do whatever he wanted to the slave. Mostly they didn't kill them because of the loss of value. I know that's heartless then, but isn't that the way power is? They don't care about using you up. They just don't want to lose money on you, right? And so they wouldn't kill them because they would represent a loss of value. They couldn't sell, couldn't do what else, do anything else. But I mean, the, the threat of violence were assumed necessary to control slaves. And the Jewish framework is interesting. They, could, they couldn't have their own people. Jews couldn't own Jews in permanent slavery. They could take them bond servitude. And Ephesians 5, 6 through, or 6, 5 through 9 describes 
an ideal situation. All things if it was good. This is the best case scenario. Uh, what Paul, what would Paul have said to slaves who are being sexually abused or asked to perform unlawful acts, possibly against their will? A glimpse into the difficulties provided in 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25, in which he instructs slaves to submit even to harsh masters and hold on to their convictions even when they suffer unjustly. These Christians, now get this, here's what, where he's coming from. These Christians were, the, were called to take their identity from Christ, no matter, uh, regardless of their circumstances. So revolt was out of the question, but their lives were to be a quiet protest and a witness to a higher calling. For the early church to advocate revolt would have been the death of the Christian movement. Could you see that? If they just set them all free, then Christianity's wiped out, not because it's a bad religion, but because it's antisocial and, and they're just not going to have it, right? Slavery and other social issues were not their focus. The gospel and its descriptions of life were. You get that? We have to get that in our mind. It was about the gospel. This was about Jesus. This was about who Jesus is and what he does to a person from the inside out, right? But, uh, the, uh, but as they represented life in Christ, they put in motion a process that would eventually destroy slavery. This forces us to question whether, well, we, I wanna, I'll skip some of that, but really good. The attitudes of the people, he says here briefly, let me just sort of summarize that entire reading. He says that it forces us to question whether or not the structures we have are godly structures or not. You know, I thank God for capitalism. Don't you thank God for capitalism? But can I tell you that, God, that capitalism is not an essentially holy way of life? It's not. Capitalism is based on consumerism, and that's a little bit different, but greed, getting, and receiving, right? So when the Berlin, where the Berlin Wall came down, I remember standing there a couple years later, we were on a mission trip with our bishop over there, Clayton and he got senior, and he, we did a little devotion there, a portion of the wall that was still standing, and he said that, listen, you need to understand that even democracy is not an essentially godly form of government. Why? Because it's based on fallible human beings. So that all of, there is no perfect government in theology for all that we would like for it to be in theology. It's not that perfect either because it's, it's operated by fallible humans and our feelings and our emotions and our desires and our sins always get in the way. So we should stop looking at government as something that's more, that, that's going to do the work of the church. It never will. Do you hear what I'm saying? Don't depend on government to do the work that God has given to the church. Don't focus so much on a form of government that we lose the sight that we're the ones who are to be the change agents, and that comes from the inside. So while communism, the, the, while the, the iron curtain was shut to most of the Western world, did you know that in countries like East Germany, Christianity thrived because of what was happening on the inside? The curtain came down, and we saw, you know what? Christianity was never eradicated. In China, there are more Christians in China than any other country in the world. Can you say praise the Lord? And Christianity is illegal. And many of those people are slaves today to their government, but they're believers in God is doing amazing things in their country. Does that help put things in perspective? Just a little bit. Slavery is equal. As a church, and the church should stand for those who can't stand for themselves. Can I get an amen on that? We should be calling out sin. We should be. But we should do it from a position that we're trying to get people saved because they need more than just freedom from slavery. They need freedom from sin. Somebody say amen. They need a purpose. They need Jesus. And when you give them Jesus, it doesn't matter what their circumstance, they can serve Him and do great things because God is using them to make important transformations. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't want to stop there with that. So, what he's saying is, he talked about a higher call, and this is what captured me. Get ready here. We're going to pray here in just a minute. Ephesians 4.1 says that we are, we are to okay, live a life worthy of the calling we you have received. Live a life worthy. So he's saying that wherever you are in life, to be called up by Christ is a higher calling than anything in this world. 
It doesn't matter how much power you have. It doesn't matter how little power you have. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have. When Christ calls you, that is the ultimate position. It is a higher call. And that call uh, is more, we, we are to be more loyal to that call than any other. Amen. Um, I have to read this passage, sorry. I, look, I want you to look with me really quickly because Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 14. Would you look at that with me because this is, this is really important. Paul is addressing this issue about change of status and coming to Christ. And I want you to see that he just finished in the top part about if, you're, if, you're called, if you come to Christ and you're married, don't seek to be unmarried. If you come to Christ and you're unmarried, don't seek to get married. He says, and he comes over three times, he says, whatever condition you find yourself in when you came to Christ, live in that condition. And here's what he says in verses 17 through 24. Mark this in your Bible. Take it home and look at it sometime because I think you'll find it interesting. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Now, sort of impossible, but, but he, he's saying, remember, he's making an example here. Keeping God's commands, uh, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. You see that? If you have a Bible, underline that. Keep God's command. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. Isn't that amazing? For, for the one who is a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. He says, when you're, you're in actual slavery, but you come to Christ, you're free in Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you imagine what kind of free Jesus? He says, similarly, the one who is free when called is Christ's slave. So at one point we're free, but we're also slaves of Jesus. Have you ever thought of yourself as a slave of Jesus? A slave. In the Old Testament, you wanted, you loved your master and you wanted to become a permanent slave and you were an indentured servant. They'd back, then they would back you up and do it against a, a doorpost and someone would take it all and pound a hole through your ear there, which represented you belong to this master permanently. And this was going to be your life because you were treated well, you had position, whatever, you decided that's the way you were going to serve. He's saying that the master is also the slave of Christ. The free people, free from our sins, are also slaves of Christ, right? You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation. When, when, when God called them. Does that make a little more sense to you? If you can get your freedom, get it. It's okay. Do it rightfully. Do it legally if you can. Right? That's what it's all about. But remember that you are free to serve Jesus. And the master, when he comes to Christ, now has a master. His name is Jesus. And when you got saved, it's the same thing for, for you. Remember, Christ made us alive, gave us a glorious inheritance, blessed us in the heavenly realms, made us one with God's own family. He calls us into a glorious eternal kingdom. We belong to God. We believe in Jesus. We belong to Jesus. Our greatest joy is to serve Him. You know, I have a little bit of a problem sometimes because too many Christians act like they're doing a faith, God a favor by accepting Christ. Amen. Oh God, aren't you glad to have somebody like me? I could have done this. I could have done that. I could have been wealthy and famous and wise, blah, 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 blah. But I gave it all up for Jesus. God says, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Too many Christians act like they're doing a favor by accepting Christ or doing God a favor. They act like true Christian service is beneath them. And I've heard things like, well, that's why we pay pastors and youth leaders and children's ministers for. You know, they need to do the work. I'm a, I'm a member of this church and I get to help make the decisions. That was, I'm sorry. Maybe that was a little mean. Many, many times, uh, many times I think we have to be careful. This comes from a place of entitlement based on our earthly position. 
Sometimes people feel like the more money or influence or popularity they have in this life, the more they think God's owing them, God owes them for saving their souls. Isn't that, that's kind of an irony, isn't it? A terrible irony. When you come to Jesus, you had nothing to offer. It doesn't matter your popularity, your wealth. It doesn't matter your position, your talent, skill. It doesn't matter. You had nothing that you could say, you should save me because... Nothing. All we had to say was, Lord, I've got my life. I give it to you. And he says, that's what I want. And he gives us all these blessings that we're so quick to complain about. Each person should live in whatever uh, uh, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them. So when Paul goes go back to Ephesians 6, chapter verses 5 and 9, Paul addressed the attitudes of Christian slaves and masters. He's not condoning slavery, but he's radically altering the relationship between masters and slaves. And here he, he talks to both parties, slaves, bond servants, employees. Here's where we bring it from the Old Testament, or the, 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 the early church now to where you live, and think of employees and servants in this world. First of all, you're obey, you're to obey what you're asked to do. You, as Christians, we are to do the job we were hired to do it, to do. Can I get an amen? If you agree to it, you do it. But it's also important the way we do it. We're to do it with respect and sincerity. Six and seven tells us wholeheartedly. Six and six tells us that we're to obey them not only in their presence, but six five tells us that we're to do it just as you would obey Christ. Six and six, as slaves of Jesus, not slaves of your master. As employees of Jesus, not employees of Walmart or whatever, wherever you work. We are employees of Jesus, and when we and He is our boss. Why? Because God's going to reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. Chapter verse 8, right? But then God's the one who hands out the pay. God's the one who hands out the rewards. If we make it to heaven, it's not because we earned our way, it's because he gave it to us. But if we go to hell, it's because we earned our way. We paid our passage. So we'll go to Jesus, it's because of all he's done for us. So then he talks to masters, employers, and bosses. Treat your slaves in the same way. It's like the golden rule on steroids. Don't just treat them the way you want to be treated. Treat them the way Jesus has treated you. So therefore, serve them the same way. Treat them with dignity and respect. Treat them. Uh, uh, um, do not threaten them because you're both slaves to the same master. You both work for the same boss. If you're Christians, we work for Jesus. So there's no favoritism with him, Ephesians 6 and 9. I love this. Master servants or husbands and wives, children, parents, employers, employees, rich, poor, popular, ordinary, black and white, young or old, Catholic, charismatic, Baptist, Pentecostal, or Baptist, we are all the same in the eyes of God. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Amen. So the question I just have for you is a quick question, and we don't have time to go any much longer on this. But would you ask yourself this question? If I took this seriously, Paul's teaching that I'm a slave of Jesus, what would that look like in your life? When you go home today and you, you are with your family, you're out in a restaurant, whatever, you go to work tomorrow morning or later tonight, if that's what it is, what would your, how might your life change if you said, you know what, I'm really, everything I'm doing, I'm doing for Jesus. He's my boss. He's the one I want to please. He's my savior. He's my king. And I'm glad to be in his house. A member of his family. I'm glad to be sealed by his spirit. I've got his authority. I've got so much in him that everything I do is uh, as his servant, to serve, not to rule. How would you address your spouse differently if you were truly a servant, act like, believe, and live like a servant, an exclusive servant to Jesus Christ? How would we address our employers, our teachers, our managers, our parents differently? How would we address our employees, our students, our children differently? realize that 
when we treat the way we treat them is the way we are treating Jesus Christ. The way we are serving them is the way we are serving Jesus Christ. Because he's the one. He's the one that doles out the rewards. He's the one who gives us everything we have. So we can do it his way, not the way the world says we should do it. Right? How would you do your work, your study, your chores differently? If you said, I'm doing this for Jesus. Amen. He's here. Look, Jesus, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do my best because I know I'm doing it for you, not just for an earthly boss and not just for a paycheck. Amen. Think about that. Yeah. So, uh, and then how would we view our co workers differently? How would we view our church participation? How would we view ministry or stewardship different if we realize that whatever we do, we're doing for Him because we are in Christ? And that's the most important relationship of all. I want to tell you two things here if we get ready quick. Here, here's what I think this means for us today. I thank God for this because I, I feel like this really encapsulates what I, Paul was, was trying to say. First thing is, you matter. You matter. I, I, really, I know we do this a lot, but I want you to, some people just need to hear this from somebody else. Would you look at somebody else in this congregation and you know, point nicely if you have to because I know you're talking to them. And just tell them, with all the love in your heart, you matter. Come on, everybody tell somebody. You matter. You, you matter. You, you're not insignificant. You're not unnecessary. You matter. You are so important to God and to other people in the church, to your families, to your job. You matter. It doesn't matter. Anything else doesn't matter. You matter. And it's not based on your situation in the world, your class, your ethnicity, your geography, your age, your physical condition, your job, your history, your wealth and poverty. You matter to God no matter what you have done, where you have been, or what others have done to you. You matter. You're important. You have value. You have dignity. And he proved it when he died on the cross for all of us. So all have equal dignity and value in the eyes of God. You matter. I want you to get that. I want you to live like that. You're important. You matter. That's not what anybody says about you. You matter. You're valuable. So valuable that Jesus would die for you and die for me. You matter. Amen. I remember the old church in the Sunday school office, they had this picture of this little little, little child who had his belly and been crying, had his arms like this, his head was down. He says, I know I'm something because God don't make no junk. Amen. You matter <coughs> because you were created <coughs> by your loving Heavenly Father. Yes. <laughs> and as servants of Christ, you matter to your family more than you can imagine. You matter to the people on your job, your bosses, this community, this state, this country, this nation, this world. You matter because you're a servant of Christ. If you get that, then everything you do changes because now it matters too. <clears throat> you matter. The second thing is what you do matters. Amen. What you do matters. It matters to God, it matters to others. And the way you do it matters as well, right? That, the way you do relationships, your work, your relationship matters to God and others as well. As slaves of Christ, we belong to Him and we serve Him. Now all of our work takes on new meaning. And we, we will treat people, uh, and, and, and the way we treat people changes as well. The way we treat people changes as well. Work's going to be done with care. <laughs> Not just to get by, we're not going to hide out in the warehouse and brag about how you took a half hour nap when the boss wasn't, wasn't watching. You're going to do your best, you're going to do it with integrity, you're going to live that way. Why? Because you're living for Christ. You're not living for that job, that company, or that whatever it is. You're living for Jesus. Amen. Amen. As you are now, you're not serving food or your boss or your customers, you're serving Christ as you serve food, your boss, your customers. Amen. Nobody in this world can we treat as unimportant. You'll never lock eyes on a person who doesn't matter to God. When you look in the mirror, remember that I matter. God cares. And when you see somebody else, you need to have that attitude. Well, they matter. 
they're important. I can't dare treat them like they don't matter, even if I disagree with their lifestyle, disagree with their politics, disagree with whatever. We've got to say they matter too. Amen. Would you stand with me today? And I want us to pray a simple prayer. Amen. I know this is a difficult subject. If you want to talk more about it, you want to ask me about my, my views on this, my scriptural understanding, I encourage you to email me, talk to me, because this is an important topic today in our, our society. Amen? Some people wouldn't like this, but I think a lot of people, a lot of Christians would have to say, yeah, I think that's right. We all, we, that I matter, you matter. God's called us to a higher call. So I want us to pray that prayer. Lord, help me live worthy of the call I have in you. Help me to live worthy of the call that you've placed on my life. I matter what I do matters. Help me to live up to that call by the help of the Holy Spirit. Would you begin to pray right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you Hello, I'm Pastor John with Prairie Center Church of God of Prophecy. I pray that this message will instruct your mind and inflame your heart and influence your will along with us to love God, care for one another, and serve the world in Jesus' name. Thank you.